right, we're looking at the subject of rewards, and the key passage, Matthew 22, can go either way. Condemnation to the lake of fire, or rewards in heaven, not the least of which is attending the wedding banquet, the wedding supper, your own wedding supper. That's a reward for faithful service. If you're not a faithful believer, you will not be allowed to stay there. You're not wearing the appropriate clothes, according to the parable, which translates into the faithfulness, which would be the uh, fine white linen that you would be wearing had you been faithful. If you're not wearing the fine white linen, you'll actually be extricated from the wedding banquet on the earth, the millennial rule during that time, the millennial kingdom on earth. But you won't be excluded into uh, uh, to the lake of fire or set, sent to the lake of fire. Important here is the perspective, the historical perspective of the future that is projected here. And one of the key points is the judgment unto eternal life or the lake of fire, whichever one, occurs before and after the millennial wedding banquet. The judgment of nations, which we just uh, uh, looked at, we can look at again, uh, is one that occurs just before the millennial rule where the sheep and the goats are gathered, all the nations of the world, the ones that are believers on the right, the ones that are unbelievers on the left, only based on did you believe in Christ at one time or another. So a judgment unto eternal life occurs before and after the millennial wedding banquet. The afterwards is all those uh, resurrected uh, who haven't been already resurrected and uh, brought into the kingdom of God those are the unbelievers that haven't been resurrected yet, and they all get judged at the great white throne judgment to see if their works themselves, their lifestyles, are sufficient to be accepted on merit only into the kingdom of God without Christ. And every one of them will not be of, of sufficient merit. So scripture elsewhere does not support the judging by God between believers and unbelievers at the time of the wedding feast. This judgment, which is an earthly judgment exclusively of mortal and physically alive believers and unbelievers occurs before anyone enters into Christ's millennial rule on earth. Because those that are left are only believers. You get into the millennial rule, now do you get into the banquet as a reward. Well, after this rule, there is the great white throne judgment, which I just mentioned. This final judgment is a heavenly judgment. It occurs in heaven exclusively of resurrected dead unbelievers from various periods of time, which occurs after our Lord's millennial rule. And that's in Revelation 20, 11 to 15. Now, t point D here, compare the passage of the judgment of nations, which is critical to the study here. And we just went over a summary of that. Matthew 25, 31 to 34, 41 and 46. But when the Son of Man comes to earth in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne on the earth, and all the nations will be gathered before him on the earth. Ezekiel 20 has a corroboration of this. And he will separate them from one another, as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you are blessed of my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. So they have uh, an inheritance. They may inherit only being present there. Or they may inherit being more faithful, uh, the different institutions and relationships and functions. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. Those it was prepared for them. But if you wanted to go along with him, you refuse to accept the grace of God for the salvation through his son's sacrifice for sins then you have only one way to go, and that would be to the lake of fire. Because the final judgment, the great white throne judgment, will prove out that your deeds won't be sufficient to have the righteousness of Christ. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So you inherit eternal life in the kingdom. You can inherit more than that in the kingdom by being more, more faithful. Likewise, Old Testament scripture testifies to the judgment of Israelites before the kingdom of age in which unbelievers will be excluded from that kingdom. Focus here only being Israel, but Gentiles as well in other passages. So in Ezekiel, as I live, declares the Lord God, surely with a mighty hand, 
and with an outstretched arm and with wrath poured out, I shall be king over you, and shall bring you out from the peoples and gather you from the lands. This is Israel, where you are scattered with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm and with wrath poured out. And I will bring you into the wilderness of the peoples, and I will therefore enter into judgment when you, with you face to face. As I entered into judgment with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt, so I will enter into judgment with you, declares the Lord God. Let's make this a little bigger here. And I shall make you pass under the rod, and I shall bring you into the bond of the covenant. This is the new covenant. And I shall purge you from your rebels and those who transgress against me. I shall bring them out of the land where they sojourn, but they will not enter the land of Israel, thus you will know that I am the Lord. Notice that judgment here is as the earth, specifically the land of Israel, in view. So it is an earthy judgment which is performed before our Lord's millennial rule. So those who gain admission into the banquet in the millennial rule on the earth are eternally secure believers. So the guests who are received into the millennium and into the wedding supper of the Lamb, the wedding banquet, have already had judgment passed on them and were deemed worthy to have eternal life starting in the millennial reign on earth. This is on the basis of having trusted alone in Christ alone for salvation. They were judged at the cross, so to speak. Therefore, all of the attendees at the wedding supper of the Lamb are eternally secure believers. Unbelievers will not even gain entrance into the millennium, much more receive admission into the wedding supper of Jesus Christ. But the question remains, not all who attend the banquet will be acceptable into that banquet. So in point F, the king addresses the inappropriately dressed man as friend, indicating a friendly attitude and not an attitude God might have toward him in one of the judgments Verse 22.11, But when the king came into view, the guests, he looked intently at a man there, he came into view, the guests, he looked intently at a man there who had no on no wedding garment. And he said, Friend, how did you come in here without putting on the appropriate wedding garment? And he was speechless. And he said, Friend, notice the, ver the word friend. The king addresses the guest as a friend. This would not be an appropriate address if the king was intent upon judging each of his guests unto heaven or hell. Objections to this point indicate that other passages in Matthew, which have the same word, friend, in them, do not use the word with a friendly connotation, but rather the opposite. Therefore, they falsely maintain that the word means the hostile opposite in Matthew 22:12 as well. <coughs> but... In Matthew 20, 13 and 16, But he, the landowner, answered one of them, a disgruntled field laborer who accused the landowner of being unfair. Friend, I am not being unfair to you. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the man who was hired last, last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do with what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? There is no indication that the landowner does not consider the disgruntled man more a friend than an enemy. And people stretch that one too. Nor is the term friend used in such a way that it indicates that he is distancing himself from him. The confrontation with a man might be done with friends or enemies in the same manner and phraseology considering the circumstances, especially the ingratitude of the individual. The use of the term friend might well be a communication to the disgruntled individual that there is no hostility or distancing coming from the landowner while he's rebuking him for his attitude. So, compare Matthew 26, 50 as well. Jesus replied, Friend, speaking to Judas Iscariot, do what you came for. Then the man stepped forward, seized Jesus, and arrested him. In light of both passages quoted above, we can observe that the hostility of one individual toward another such as the laborer toward the landowner, or the betrayal of our Lord by Jesus, Judas Iscariot, does not rule out the landowner's consideration of the laborer as a friend, or our Lord's rule, view of Judas as a friend in spite of the Judas's betrayal. <clears throat> Schofield writes, Here is one of the most touching things in the Bible. The Lord still reaches out to Judas in the friendship while he's about to be betray him. So, a king who is intent upon looking for offenders 
verses 11 to 12 of 20, Matthew 22, does not ask a man in a conciliatory way how he came into the wedding banquet without appropriate attire, wedding attire which the king himself provided for each guest. Here's your, here's your wedding attire. Go put it on. Refuse this. The, king has no ex the friend has no explanation to offer. He has no excuse, it says. That was a, what, that's all it says. It was often traditional at Oriental wedding suppers that the host provide a robe for each guest to wear and footwear. And in this circumstance, it must be concluded that the speechless guest offer, could offer no excuse for his obvious referral to put it on. It would also be discovered that the believer who, has unfaithful, who was unfaithful to the Lord with his life on earth will not have proper wedding attire either when he appears at the wedding supper of Jesus Christ in the church. And he will likewise have no explanation or no excuse to offer. So point H, there is no excuse for not performing one's divinely appointed good works. That's the meaning conveyed here <clears throat> in Matthew 22. Although believers will also be wearing robes of righteousness, symbolic of the imputed righteousness of God, as a result only of their moment of faith alone in Jesus Christ, God's Son alone, Romans 4, 5, Isaiah 61, 10, only faithful believers will, will wear other robes which are representative of their faithful living on earth. Revelation 19.8 speaks of fine linen, which believers wear at their wedding to our Lord as the bride of Christ. This fine linen, the verse goes on to say, represents righteous acts on the part of the believer and not a gift upon which salvation is based. Ephesians 2.8-10 through 10. These acts are the righteous acts, the divine good works, notice acts is plural, which each believer himself performs. <clears throat> so the fine, fine linen does not represent the robe of the absolute righteousness of Christ. Notice that the robe is singular, which is received at the moment an individual trusts alone in Christ alone for salvation. Romans 3, 21 and 24, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, and Romans 3, 22, 4, 1 and 8. 1, 2, 8. Believers of all ages, therefore, Old Testament ages, church age, future ages, and all sovereignly provided are all sovereignly provided with specific divine good works prepared in advance for us to do. <clears throat> for the church age, it's mentioned specifically Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, especially verse 10, which we as believers are enabled to perform by God's grace and by living a life of faith energized by love for the Savior. It's led by the Holy Spirit. These divine acts are rewarded in heaven and on earth. So point I, the righteousness of Christ is not something scripture portrays that one would put on as wedding clothes for the wedding banquet in the kingdom of heaven as a voluntary deed <coughs> for this specific event. Hence, the wedding clothes cannot represent the righteousness of Christ. And that's a contention here with some. An individual immediately receives the righteousness of Christ upon a moment of faith alone in Christ alone in any dispensation. This parable portrays individuals putting on wedding clothes for a wedding banquet in the kingdom of heaven for this specific event. Since believers must automatically be clothed in the righteousness of Christ for the moment they believe and before they arrive at the banquet, then these particular clothes they put on for the, spe the specific event cannot be the righteousness of Christ. Unbelievers would not be clothed in the righteousness of Christ, by the way, and would not be given an opportunity to don the righteousness of Christ at the time of the wedding banquet, nor gain interest into the banquet inside the kingdom of heaven. Since the guest that was excluded could not be an unbeliever because he gained entrance into the kingdom and into the wedding banquet itself, and then the wedding cloth clothing which is portrayed as something an attendee in the banquet must put on in order to remain in the banquet or be sent out into outer darkness and weeping and gnashing of teeth, that must be something other than that which represents the righteousness of Christ. I guess I've made my point there. Romans 3, 21 to 22. But now a righteousness from God, apart from law, has, has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ <coughs> to all who believe. So we go way back with Abraham, Genesis 15. Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him as righteousness. <coughs> and to Adam and Eve, back in the garden. What does the scripture say in Romans 4, 3? Abraham believed God, there it is, and it was credited to him as righteousness. So, we move on to the outer darkness and weeping and gnashing of teeth. And what does that mean? Many contend 
This is the lake of fire. More on this next time.